Welcome to the Valley Queens podcast. Tonight, we'll be discussing internalized oppression with Maurice Lacey. Maurice is a core trainer for the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, where he travels the country conducting undoing racism and community organizing workshops. He currently teaches foundations, advocacy, and social policy courses at Columbia University School of Social Work and Hunter College School of Social Work. He has over 25 years of direct care experience with vulnerable populations and holds a leadership position in the New York City Department of Health Cure Violence Program in Central Harlem. Maurice Lacey, thank you so much for coming into my podcast called Valley Queens, where we discuss systemic mechanisms that, um, that we can see manifested through our everyday life in our town. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. So we are going to discuss today internalized oppression. And before we get into anything, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's one of the one of the least studied aspects of racism, but probably one of the most destructive and virulent forms of it, one of the pieces that keeps all of it together and operating in our systems and within our cultures and throughout our lived experiences. It operates from a, from a uh, conscious and unconscious level. Uh, so sometimes we are aware that it's happening, but most of the time we're actually not aware um, that it's actually occurring. I don't know if you are familiar with uh, the work of Bell Hooks, yes. the Greek writer. Uh, she calls this our dirty laundry because <laughs> uh, it's oftentimes not a discussion that we have uh, in, in, in in public spaces. Um, but here tonight, obviously, we're going to have a open, honest dialogue about it, you know, in a way that could be helpful for those of us that are people of color and those that are also come to be called um, white. So so just as a, as a definition, um, mm -hmm. I focus mostly on the in, inferiority side. So it has two sides, right? Um, one side is the inferiority side and the other side is superiority. If you Google internalized oppression, you 95% of the material that you're gonna come up with is gonna be, guess what, on the inferiority side. Mm. But we believe that you cannot have one without the other. So we try uh, as best as possible to have uh, a balanced conversation about how they both work. But for tonight's conversation, we're probably focused predominantly on the inferiority side because I'm coming out of my, my lived experience and I think that's the most authentic place that I can come from. Um, okay, so what does it look like in everyday life? Internalized oppression, what does it look like? How does it manifest? Yeah, so maybe it'd be helpful, maybe even give a definition. So on the inferiority side, it's the multi-generational process of disempowerment and dehumanization, whereby people of color internalize the negative images, stereotypes, mm -hmm. and symbols of themselves from the dominant white culture. And we live them out through unhealthy unhealthy behaviors and attitudes. So the first piece to really understand is that it's multi-generational and that it didn't just start now. Um, it's been said that from the first time that our people, those of us that are people of color, the first time that we had contact with European colonizers, invaders, and slavers, something began to happen to our people in terms of how they started to, to see themselves. And that has carried over from generations uh, to our present. The second piece that's important to understand in that definition uh, is the messages. That we all, regardless of color uh, or racial designation, receive messages about who we are, about our place and about our value within a particular society. And that starts at birth and it doesn't end until death. And these are a relentless, relentless amount of messages that are, that are continuous. Uh, some of them are subliminal and some of them we are fully fully aware of. But these messages about our value and about our place and about our sense of belonging become internalized, right? Become internalized. And when it becomes internalized, it becomes a part of, of who we are. And we develop this thing uh, that we call manifestations as a result of this internalization process that happens over the course of our, uh, of our lifetime. And we feel that it's, it's unavoidable for people of mm -hmm. color to some degree not to internalize some of these ne negative messages, stereotypes and images of themselves. You think about television, uh, what our young people are exposed to about themselves. I grew up in a generation where I didn't see, maybe I saw one positive black image 
on, on television. And that wasn't until like the 70s. And I saw my people as slaves, as butlers, as maids, as, mm -hmm. as drivers. Uh, the people in my school, the ones that were in, in leadership were the, the, the principals, the superintendents, predominantly all, all white, you know, political leadership, predominantly all white. <laughs> So everywhere I looked, the world was very, very white. And for a little black and brown boy or children to grow up in such an environment, it absolutely gets internalized and it does have an impact on how they see themselves and also um, also their, their community. And I'm just thinking about the school experience of our children, right? If you think about it, like we take our schools seriously here in Long Island uh, in Nassau <laughs> in Valley Scream. Um, but we think about what's being taught to our children in our social studies and histories classes. I mean, I, I speak from the, from the black experience, but for our Latinx children and for our um, AAPI children, um, Asian or Asian Pacific Islander children or, or indigenous children, what they may see in the history books about themselves is absolutely nothing. <laughs> you may get one, one or two passages, if that. Exactly, know? it's like what they see is that they're invisible. They're, they're, they're invisible lives in our history. And in Black History Month, we know we get them off. And you, you can almost, you know who the who are going to be the handpicked, you know, Black heroes and sheroes that it's going to be. It's going to be the standard, you know, who, those who are essentially palatable to the white masses. So even that is, in one sense or another, whitewashed. Yeah. And has, has impact also, right? Um, so you're talking about like a lot... Uh Partially, it's also about representation, because like you said, when you were growing up in schools, you didn't see black teachers or black leadership. Um, and by the way, that hasn't changed much. Um, in Valley Stream, we still don't have in Valley Stream 24. We don't have black teachers. Um, we have about 5% teachers of color for a student body that is 86% students of color. In our town, we're majority minority and almost all of our leadership is white older men. Like, let's put gender in there too, you know? That's right. And um, it's not much better in New York City, a school, a school system that I'm very familiar with that I uh, have done working. Um, there there, there does tend to be a fair amount of, of um, women teachers of color. But when it comes to men teachers of color, I believe the last stat I saw was less than 2% black men. And the, the statistics are so low on Latinx men that they, they don't, keep, they don't oh. keep track of it. It's just so low. But I, what I want what I want folks to think about that are listening here is what does it mean for black and brown children to go through a K through 12 experience and never see no one that looks like them in in front of that classroom? And the second layer to that is what does it mean for even white kids to go through K through 12 and not see another person like me and you in the front of that classroom? What is the impact on on that? And how does that transfer itself into their ideas of their superiority versus my inferiority? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's very, it's very in, impactful. Um, so I, as I mentioned before, um, um, there's manifestations that derive from the experiences of us receiving messages about who we are and about our value uh, and our place. And one of the main, main ones um, that I've seen in my community, um, and as I travel, and as I've traveled around the world, I've also seen it present as well, this whole idea around colorism. Like mm -hmm. There is a pecking order in our communities, a hierarchy uh, around skin color. Um, we have adopted to and internalized this Eurocentric ideal of beauty that follows us everywhere, even until the workplace, but in our social dealings with each other, but also in our own family systems. Um, we see um, differential treatment for a lighter complexion our children that are more closer to the white ideal. I've seen it in, in, in my own family to, to, to some degree or another, like the dark skinned children are cute and the light skinned ones are beautiful. And mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the, the eight by 10 pictures are the light skinned babies in the living room and the two by fours are the dark skinned ones on the black dresser. And you know, we know grandma may love both, both of those grandbabies equally as, as well, but there's something about those light skinned babies that bring another level of joy that we that is also connected to this this idea around um, well that's very interesting because you talk about latinx and i grew up in puerto rico and we had all different color puerto ricans we were all puerto ricans right but we ranged like i'm a light-skinned puerto rican and they're like really dark-skinned puerto ricans and i remember um 
my grandmother used to tell me, marry a white person so you can improve our race. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh my God, like two of your children are black. <laughs> Like yeah. it, so the idea that's internalized oppression, that's internal, right? And, and because she wasn't very white either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how does that work within a person? Like, how does that work? What are the justifications they put behind those sentiments? Um, it's the idea that white is is better. Um, and let me just say this by the way that this Eurocentric ideal of beauty that creates colorism. Uh, it's not just skin tone, it's also hair texture. Mm -hmm. It's also uh, facial features and to some degree body type. Uh, and and so we see that for the, I grew up in a, in a generation where I saw on most dresses in the homes that I went into, especially my family members, this thing called Ambi Skin Tone Cream, which is actually I learned later was bleaching cream, uh, like the skin bleach, right? Wow. So, uh, so, uh, and by the way, that's uh, one of the number one selling feminine project products in Asian countries right now is this, this, this bleaching cream out of people's obsession with getting closer to that, mm. to that, to that, to the white ideal. And, you know, and this has deep psychological ramifications um, for our young people, but also I would say adults as well. And, and this goes way back. I mean, even to... 1954, uh, uh, Brown versus the Board of Education, and they did the doll test. Mm. You, may, you may recall, and they showed the, bl uh, the black child, the, the dolls, the light doll, and I mean, I mean, the white doll and the black doll, and the one that <laughs> we, we we know how that how that experiment went. That by the way, that experiment has been duplicated now over over 20 times. One of the most recent studies was done actually in Puerto Rico. Oh. The homeland of your your people. And <laughs> oh they, no! They, and they actually added a few questions to it. Not only um, which doll was the most uh, beautiful, but they also asked the question of which doll was the nicest. And right? tell us mm -hmm. what were the results, just in case people don't know. So not only uh, predominantly did the children pick uh, the white doll as the most beautiful, another doll, the doll had their their complexions. Um, but they also said that the white doll was um, the nicest. Mm. And the most troubling part of watching the experiments on YouTube, they also asked the children, which one of the dolls is most like you? And you saw this long pause and hesitation with the children, like pointing their finger down very, very slowly to the darker complexion doll. Cognitive dissonance right there. Dissonance. If that doll is, is the smartest and the prettiest, and I look like this one, who am I? But that's very interesting that they asked about who was the nicest. Yes. And and then connecting physicality to psychological traits or personality traits. It's very interesting because our brains do that. Um, yes. It's called it's also called the halo effect. The idea yes. that if we see somebody who's very beautiful, we assume they're nice and they're benevolent yes. and whatever. Yes, yes, um, yes. And it's interesting that you talk about that. And this is multi-generation generational because um in the small i so i was born and raised in a very small town in puerto rico mm -hmm. and we know the history of it it was colonized by the spanish uh who then brought african slaves so that's why puerto ricans were all mixed of everything mm -hmm. um but when the colonizers came all the people who were native puerto ricans that were already there they thought they were like gods mm -hmm. that's what they thought and the colonizers started treating them Violently, I was going to say not very nicely, but let's not euphemize it. Like they were being genocidal and raping all the women and killing everyone and taking their land. Um, and they were like, wait a second. Like, I thought they were gods. I thought they were good and nice. So they took one of the, this is a myth. I don't know if it actually happened, but this is a story. They took one of the colonizers and drowned him in order to see if he was mortal or not. Yeah, that so that's how heavy that belief was internalized, right? Ever since then, the message that came with colonization is that we're good. We're gonna, we're here because we're above you. We're superior, like gods. Right. Um, and that has a. I don't think it has um changed. I don't think it has diminished. I think it has evolved. 
yeah, in the I, matter I, that is expressed. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it has evolved like everything else. And right now we're dealing with like racism 3.0 right now. And the same thing has occurred with the in, in, internal, the internalized uh, racial inferiority uh, among our people. And built into that is not only that white is better, but also there's an anti-blackness mm. built into it that also keeps it going and, and, and gives it life and a type of energy that's, that's very, very harmful um, to all people of color, but particularly to those that come to have been called black. So that's just one of the, one of the manifestations. There's another one called uh, distancing. Mm -hmm. uh, we as people of color would distance ourselves from each other out of shame or our own built-in resentment um, for our people. Um, and distancing can take, take on many different forms. Um, uh, we can try in some ways to educate ourselves away from our people. Like if I get, I got the degrees and I got the credentials, then I'm better than those folks over there. And we mm. will create language around that. Like they still ain't got their stuff together. Like they've been here just as long as I have. What's up with them? Like they could do the same thing. Like I, if I made it, you can make it too. Uh, that so that whole distancing thing and not understanding people's personal struggles and all of the complicated factors that go in that go into who become quote, quote unquote successful. We got to even define what successful actually means, right? Is that really about income? Or is that about like something else, right? But we would distance ourselves through that through religion. We we distance ourselves. And one of the main ones I think is class. Mm class distancing, those that find themselves in the middle class, upper class, particularly here in America, will quickly distance themselves or shun mm -hmm. those that are considered to be poor and actually begin a process of blaming their own people for their situations around poverty and even sometimes discrimination. So uh, it's sort of like the pull yourself by the bootstraps sort of myth scenario yourself, yeah, this whole myth yeah, we, we bought into like that myth of meritocracy we have bought into that uh, as well and i resent that whole idea about uh, meritocracy um my maternal side of the family is from south carolina and my paternal side is actually from panama uh, so i have panamanian and jamaican roots but also south carolinian roots from my mother's side and my grandmother worked from what we call can't see to can't see like can't see to can't see which means she got up to go to work before the sun came up and she oh. didn't come home until the sun went down. That's what we meant, what we mean by working for, it's a Southern term. And um, she was born poor in 1906 in South Carolina and she died poor in 1970 in South Carolina. But she wasn't damn poor because she didn't work hard. She was poor because the work that she did wasn't valued and compensated properly in the society mm -hmm. in which she lived in. And not for nothing, the top 1% uh, over 90% of those folks that are there, and I'm not saying people don't work hard on, on all levels because they are, but I'm saying there's far and few in between. And when you think about statistically speaking, 90% of them are operating off in, inherited wealth. Like it's mm -hmm. not hard to make 100 million when you start with 50 million, you know? But some of our people start start off in debt, right? So that whole piece, I don't want to divert too much, but that's, but that's an interesting piece that met, met, so we would distance ourselves from that um, location wise. Like we will separate mm. ourselves from our communities when we get 15 cents past uh, a dollar. And um, I guess I'm, I was guilty of that to some degree. Uh, some years ago, I want to be authentic here. Uh, when I moved from South Jamaica, Queens to Valley Stream, I thought that it was materially better. It was a much wider place than it is now. Um, I'm not going to say I regret moving here because I love this community uh, as well, but I lost a lot when I came here as well. Mm. I moved from a community into a neighborhood. Um, this is a very, very sterile environment. I, I don't, I don't know any of my neighbors' last names. Um, sometimes people speak, sometimes they don't. They're not, they don't mistreat me, but it's like a, a distance out here, right? That I'm not accustomed to. We went to each other baby showers where I came from. Um, like <laughs> we went to each other barbecues. Like it was a, it was a. We went to, we went to the same churches. You know, we saw our children play together, and out here it was like. None of that. So much so that when my son, we first moved out there, my uh, son was 12 years old. He began to run away from home. And we was running like, we got you in this great community, in this great school, and now you're going back to like what we consider the ghetto. What's up with that? And we found out later that he was running away because he wanted to be with friends. And he had a hard time bonding and feeling in place, right? Like he belonged out here. And I noticed that myself, that I was going back to that community as well, from my haircuts to worship, to find the food that I wanted, <laughs> and just to be more reached sometimes, right? So that. So, we so call you, that, 
you call it like social mobility, but uh, it's the big part. It's called black and brown flight. Well, what I didn't understand and what needs to be looked at more, and I, I agree with social mobility and upper mobility, is that when people like you and I leave those communities, we also take our economics with us. Mm -hmm. We also take our ability to role model, right? And we, we live a void in that community, an absence in that community of, of role models and, and our economic resources. And there's no one there to break up the fights, to, talk, to have a talk with that young boy or girl that's just starting to smoke weed and act out. Like we're not there like to act on the behalf of others that, 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 that may need us. And that is a loss. That so that's community. interesting that you talk about sort of, we were talking about like representation, but that's not enough. Diversity is not enough. Because you said, okay, so for example, here's some stats. Valley Stream is about 60% people of color, right? The leadership in our institutions are not reflective of that at all. It's reflective of a Valley Stream that was 20 years ago, right. right? But also, like you were saying, you moved from a community to a neighborhood. Like the culture is also not diverse or inclusive. No, it's not. So here's a question, for example, like, a lot of people say like, oh, well, you know, uh, we have representation, we have diversity. That's it. What's the problem? Uh, we don't have equity. That's the problem. <laughs> um, I can't, I sometimes, um, I, I, diversity is a great term and it's not a bad thing in and of itself, uh, but diversity without equity is still injustice. Mm -hmm. we, we can have a very, very rainbowish type of community, but if we don't have power sharing, someone is going to be left behind and someone's going to be lifted up and someone's going to be pushed down. And you see problems here in Valley Screen with police stops. that's not being properly documented uh, with differential treatment. Once our children are arrested in our N Nassau County court system, uh, we see child welfare disparities in child welfare and who gets reported and who ends up in foster care. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on out here that's under the cover because we got nice lawns and we got nice houses, mm -hmm. but we don't, we're not paying attention to what's really happening um, in the community at large in terms of those stats that you just, that, that you just talked about. Um, yeah, so yeah, so that the distancing is, an, is another one I was, another one is uh, protectionism. Mm -hmm. What is that? But so protectionism is um, sometimes people of color think it's their God-given duty or right to protect white people from any type of emotional or psychological discomfort. So they will shut people like me down that want to speak up and speak out about what's going on in Valley Stream or elsewhere because people are gonna get upset. Um, so they have, you find people tone, poli we tone police each other uh, we are, we make excuses for injustice. They didn't mean it like that. The cops stop all the kids. They don't just stop you. Mm. They stop everybody. Um, like trying to equalize mistreatment as if that's, as if that makes it, um, that makes it okay. Uh, I do, I'm doing racism workshops. I've seen in workshops where we get to some really growing edge stuff in there. So, and we talk in, um, real life circumstances that impacts people's lives of all races. And sometimes we see, um, white people cry. Um, and when that happens, you see people of color run across the room with tissues and napkins, dapping them and nannying them and following them to the bathroom. And like they have the, the circle around them. Uh, and that can be a very human thing. Cause I don't, I don't like to see any human in discomfort. Uh, I don't. <laughs> and, um, but the problem is that when we see women of color cry, particularly black women cry, no one comes to the rescue with the napkins. And there's something about white tears, particularly the tears of white women, that has a huge, huge impact um, on our ability to respond to injustice mm -hmm. in the way that it should be responded to, and the impact of those tears, how it affects us as people. That some people say is part of our historical memory, that we know that sometimes when those that have, that have come to be called white uh, get upset, there's usually a consequence for people of color. People get fired, people get demoted, people get labeled. You know, and there was a time in our history where people got whooped and people got killed. Um, so that that historical memory seems to be still with us in some ways. And that whole idea around protectionism is a, is a real thing. And 
happens in so, 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 so many ways. So, so prote does protectionism, for example, uh, does it include the idea of like people of color perpetuating the myth of colorblindness, for example? Yes. Yes, it's also connected to denial as well. Okay. That we sometimes as people call are in denial about the impact um, and the sheer magnitude of, of race and racism in the role that it plays in our lives. So we become blind to it uh, in this state that we call the denial, like we refuse to see what the lived truth is around race and racism uh, to a point where we would look at each other when people, so when people do speak out, it's like, shut up, shut up, be quiet. No, it's not that, it's this. You know, we're blaming like on individual behavior, you know, well, this is personality. If he had a better personality, he would get, he would get more job callbacks, like all that kind of stuff starts to, start to press. So it's not only protecting white people's individuals, it's also protecting white institutions. institutions. Right. So that's what my follow-up question was. Um, we can talk all day about interpersonal racism, right? Mm -hmm. And how, uh, how you can call out and, you know, internalize depression in people of color um, when they're protecting other white people. But what about, how do you address or go about strategically to um, address internalized oppression um, when people of color are defending and protecting institutions versus other people. Mm -hmm. Does that defer? No, it doesn't defer. I mean, it's a, it's a slippery slope. Okay, tell me. Um, on the one hand, I want to embrace my brothers and sisters that I know have received these messages and have been dealt with. Um, for the most part, through no fault of their own, they didn't actually these messages. These messages were given to them, so they have been affected by this this thing, right? And if we right. look at kind of a disease, I can't get mad at people for getting sick, right? right? What I can be concerned about is if I give you medicine for your sickness and you don't take it, right? So people, so the refusal to talk about it and to have conversations, for me, it takes me to another level emotionally. That is that I'm still that I still have difficulty with. Mm -hmm. So what's really, what's really important in that? In this, in this whole dialogue of, um, is for us to be able to develop the language and fluency to have conversations with each other where both sides come out on the other end of that conversation with their humanity is still intact. Mm. I, 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 can, I'm very, I can be very proficient at beating people down and then blaming, and, but where does that get us, right, in terms of undoing what, 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 what needs to be done, right? And not for nothing, we oftentimes talk about the systems uh, which is where my work is really centered on, on systems and structures. Um, but guess who's the system? Like we are. The system is people, right? The people make the culture, the people make the organizations. Right, exactly. you know? So we are in these systems as, as, as gatekeepers, right? We're gatekeepers in the, in the systems that's sometimes oppressing us and even our own, our own communities. So we also need to be able to talk and have open and honest dialogue with each other about how we are in um collusion with maintaining the system of structural and systemic racism because there been i can look back on my own life and my practice of social work where i was in collusion with the system un unwittingly and most of the time sometimes unconsciously and then there was a point where i started to get information and i realized what i was doing and then i had to maintain it uh, and that's okay. not always easy that's not always easy because some I, I was able to, to leave jobs but not everybody's in that position to like pack up and leave jobs so that's interesting because, okay, so let's talk about, for example, in Valley Stream, our institutions are not representative, right? Um, there are a few people of color that are in positions of power, right? From what I know from the psycho social psych literature and the prejudice and discrimination literature is that when you have the first few people trickle in, they're usually people who follow, who play the game, who follow the rules of the system because otherwise it would be too too homogenous for other people to come in. So mm -hmm. once you follow the rules, right? Let's suppose, I don't know, you're running for a, an election or something and you're a person of color, right? Uh, this might manifest such as um, you don't mention diversity, prejudice or discrimination because all of a sudden you're the angry person of color, you know? Mm -hmm. 
doing this thing, or you go even a step further and you say, well, there's no racism. I think we should help everyone at once. There, this is not an issue. Um, so then you have those people in there in the system and there's no systemic change. Right. And then it becomes, oh, the system says, oh, we have representation. We have diversity. So we wash our hands of this. How do we break that? Organize. Been, from within or from without? On both sides, but particularly from within. Okay. So we be very strategic and organized because the last thing we want is a bunch of unemployed, <laughs> anti racist, social justice advocates, right? Uh, so we got to be strategic and we can't be foolish in the way that we organize and the way that we raise our voices and speak truth to power. But there's a process that has occurred across the country in many, many communities that are like the Valley Screams of of America, where we have seen some really fundamental change uh, take place. I mean, we can think of the big examples like Georgia, but there's been a lot of other smaller communities like Wilmington, North Carolina, and other places where they've, they've, had come, they've come together and talk as a community uh, across race about injustice. I'm sorry, my soup's fake. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so what would be, so basically get people in there. Get people in there and we have to start talking and we have to start organizing. But I think a big piece of this is we have to have our own affinity spaces. Mm-hmm. Like there's some things that I realized that my black neighbors here in Valley Street are not gonna talk about in front of white folks. And one of the things, it's one of the best organizing pieces, but p- probably one of the most dangerous because the last thing that a lot of my white friends, my brothers, white brothers and sisters wanna see is black and brown folks together. <laughs> having their own conversations. <laughs> That's some scary Oof. stuff to some people. Uh, Terrifying. Stuff, but, we, <laughs> but they also need to come together and talk among themselves as well. Uh, we, so we don't encourage not just black and brown people, but those that have come to be called white, come together and have their conversations about what's going on without, because you know what happens when you put all of us in the room together, particularly when you're trying to build a new movement around changes, um, First of all, you get a lot of bluster. You get a lot of people showboating. Uh, but you also run the run the risk of, and this is my experience uh, working in New York City with different groups, is uh, you start getting into the woke Olympics. You know, oh. um, you know who's read the most books? Who's got the most black and brown friends? Like white people throw each other under the bus. Uh, there's a lot of competition in white spaces. Like that's part of their superiority side is to be competitive, right? <laughs> Um, so that, comp- that competitive piece uh, comes up, uh, the paternalism pops up. Can you explain uh, that so that people know what you mean by paternalism? Yeah, paternalism is a is a, a manifestation of internalized white superiority, where white people want to take charge and be in charge and actually feel and believe in, within themselves that they have the best answers and the best ideas about the way things should be in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a very, very, you can't, real, even the most sincere white people have difficulty getting rid of their paternalism because somewhere deeply embedded in some of their spirits is the idea that you all would do better if you were just more, if you were just more like us, if you were just more like us. Well, and that's better. also like, I've seen that within institutions. Um, for example, in the school district that I'm working with, that I'm trying to work with, um, I suggested they form a DEI committee, diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. Um, And that committee is supposed to be a disruptive group because the culture has yielded zero teachers that are black and only like four Hispanic teachers in an entire district. So I literally told the administration and the people, I was like, this group can't be you guys. It can't be the same people who perpetuated the inequities that is in charge of this group. And they didn't, listen really um so then you have then that's a problem because that was supposed to be a safe space but it's not a safe space as a group so that was supposed to be a space for that um but i think it's very interesting that you talk about the paternalism aspect of it and the idea that oh we know better because we're in power and we're the leaders and we know better but that also from the people of color's perspective, we engage in that as well um, in that, oh, well, you know, they must know better because they've been doing this for a longer time. Or 
And that comes even back um, while, you know, America was just building itself and there was slavery. Even slaves would tell amongst each other, like, well, at least they're giving us food and shelter. And if otherwise we'd be dead. Um, so I think it's really interesting how that has evolved in that way. Yeah, and for, some piece, for every manifestation of superiority, there's a, there's a supporting internal inferiority piece. So for us, it's, to, it's just to assimilate. Like when they get yeah. this, we just assimilate. And there's a sense of, of also on the superiority side, this idea of entitlement, that we are entitled like, to be in charge. Like we built this school, we built this community, it's like it has this historical ramifications, but also present present day is as well. Um, that we are the best to lead. That falls into this whole, yeah. So that's tough. So yeah. let's say I'm going to ask your advice. Um, let's say you have somebody in there within the system, right, that wants to affect systemic change, right. Um, and they're a person of color, or maybe they're a minority in some way. This part of a disenfranchised group, and they you know, and they're aware of the barriers and the obstacles. They're aware of the racism, the bigotry, the intolerance, whatever. Um, but they're alone in there. Mm -hmm. What do they do? They got to wait until they get a critical mass. Mm. They got to wait until they get a critical mass and they got to try their best. Even though I push back on this term allies, they have to get white allies in the battle. It can't just be people of color on one side and white folks on the other side. Mm. We have to form multiracial multicultural coalitions around uh, power sharing in order to be in order to be effective. We tried just doing it with just black folks in the 60s and it didn't work. Okay? We tried that with the black nationalist movement and to some degree Cesar Chavez tried it with his farm workers. It's like you gotta have inclusive movements. Um, because that that also lifts up all our humanities at the same time. Right? Um, and then what happened? Martin Luther King got assassinated in, in 2020. At Malcolm X, a, a, a lot of people were assassinated. And then in 2020, we're celebrating Martin Luther King, which was whitewashed and co-opted by our history classes right. to <laughs> teach us to be nonviolence and be nice yeah. about it. That's right. But but I, I want to go back to what you said. That's something very important. When you're that only voice that you have to, it's one of the hardest things and one of the most frustrating experiences is to wait for allies and to develop allies. And, and I, the most powerful tool we have in this battle for social justice is our relationships, is our ability to create sustainable and meaningful relationships that supports equity for, for all people. Um, and without that, we go nowhere because if we don't have those authentic relationships, we can't have courageous conversations. Like you hear people, you know, you've heard somebody say, I got, uh, she, she's my best friend, she, she's white, but we can't talk about race. And that's not your best, then how I question friendship. Like, <laughs> That's not an authentic relationship when you can't do that. And the same thing with our workplaces. Um, you can't say you're working, I have a great job, but you can't talk about race. Like, that's not a great job. It's it's a job. It, it pays well, but it's not Let's great. just say the right word. It's not, not just great. It's toxic. It, right. So building that critical mass is so, so, so important. And the coming together and the relationship building is, is really, so, see, the system is very good at picking us off when we come out as long rangers. I don't know if you've ever heard of your 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 I'm old enough to almost be your grandfather, but there's a there was a, a game called Jack in the Box. Okay. Dun, 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 yeah. Da, 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 pop goes the weasel. And we can't be the Jack in the Box because I don't know if you remember that game. You, you, you remember that game? Terrifying. How Jack, how Jack pops. It's funny how he's Jack in the Box, but the thing is pop goes the weasel. So he's Jack in the Box, but he's a weasel. What's a weasel? It's conniving, sneaky. Mm -hmm can't be trusted. And when Jack pops out of that box, he's not sturdy and strong. He's wobbling all over the place. And what do we usually do? Jack gets slammed back in the box. Mm -hmm. but we get we get all wound up and we get frustrated and we pop out in the ADC and we start raising our voice in the wrong way and we get slapped right back down. Our institutions are very, very effective at slamming people down mm -hmm. um, when you when you go through the Jack in the Box experience. And I, I've seen it happen right before my eyes and I've if I, I, I've experienced it myself. That's why I talk about that critical mass is so, so, so important because it's very hard to slam down 10 heads at the same time. Like it, it just it just can't be done. Um, and that's part of the organizing work too. Like how do we do that? How do we create a network? And when I say network, I'm not talking about business cards and websites. 
Mm-hmm. We're talking about again about the strategic alignment of relationships. Yeah. And build a net where no one that no one falls through because too many people fall through these these nets that have been created out here. Um, and that has that has that has to change. So here's the thing, right? So we can get some white allies, right? Um, what about getting people of color like us to recognize their internalized oppression? How do you even start doing that when they don't even realize that it's a thing, <laughs> that it yeah. exists? You got to start having that that conversation. But first, we have to have we have to have the language. Um, and, I, and and I'm still developing too. I've been doing this now for 20 years. But I'm still I'm still developing because the same way that I talk to my nine year old grandson is not the same conversation that I have with my forty year old. It's a different. So learn how to have that conversation in a way that's helpful and supportive is really, really, really critical. And then helping people to see it, like in their yeah. own lives. Um, I've seen colorism. I've operated with colorism, but uh, this whole idea around powerlessness is another manifestation of it. Um, exaggerated visibility, self hate. And how it plays itself out in addictions and all of so, like people can sometimes see these manifestations um, operating in their lives or in the lives of people around them, and people start to make a connection. And not all of us are affected by every one of them, like exactly. But we don't think any of us can escape any of them. Like you can't escape all of them. You, you, it's like impossible living in this society. Yeah. You, you, yeah. I mean, not only around race, but around like gender, and around sexuality, and around pop. Like we get messages. That if you're poor, something's wrong with you, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So we have to learn how to have the conversation and continue to develop the language and continue to come together. One of the problems that we have here is that we don't create spaces to come together mm. as people of color. And I know, I know here in Valley Screen, we used to have these community meetings, uh, like once every three months or so. I, didn't, I haven't even seen that happening. But that's not a safe place to start talking about none of this stuff. Mm, no. So unless we develop relationships like you and I are doing right now, we can't even begin the conversation. And that means we're going to be stuck in the same situation for years and years to come because we can't we can't talk about it. We can't talk about it. all the people in front of that room that were leaders in those community board meetings I went to. No one ever said they're all right. <laughs> yeah. For years, I think there's a black woman now, but uh, 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 two, or uh, Latinx, but for years when I first moved here. And this hasn't been that long ago. We're talking about 17 years ago. Wow. It was all white for years and no one said, no one said a word. Well, okay. So, so if, how, I mean, some people are like really impatient because it's been decades now and it's almost like nothing has happened. I mean, like, why do we, right? People of color who recognize this, have to start changing the hearts and minds of people who are literally against us. Can't we do it in another way? Um, I haven't totally <laughs> figured that out. Me neither. One, one, of the thing, one of the things that I that I do uh, grapple with is that, that I do support is it. We have to make um, being racist. And practicing white supremacy, uncomfortable. Good. It has to be harder to be racist than it is to be anti-racist in our systems, institutions. We haven't come to that point yet. Um, and that means one of the problems that I have with across the country and here as well is that we keep trying to provide conversational and programmatic issues for structural problems. Structural problems require structural solutions. Mm-hmm. But we don't want to do structural solutions. We want to do transactional stuff. We want to put out statements and we want to hire, bring on two people of color on the, put them on the boards. So it's performative. Performative. <laughs> but nothing is really changing on the structural level, which is where the power is at. Um, and you have to make that uncomfortable. So they not only does... Yeah, but, not only does racism have to be uncomfortable, but I know you've mentioned this before, which is the idea of like, there has to be some power transfer. Yeah. And ha- nobody gives up power willingly. It has to be snatched. Frederick somebody- Douglass said that. <laughs> yes, you're right. It has to be literally snatched from the hands. And then once you snatch it, you gotta put your claws in it to keep it. Because I've learned over these last few years, I did not 
I, I never imagined that we could lose so much ground in civil rights and social justice in such a short period of time as we've lost over these last five years or so. I could mm -hmm. not, like the voter suppression laws, what we're doing in, with immigration, um, I never imagined that. There's a law now in Georgia that you cannot can't even give people food and water while they're on the voting line. Like, like what is that? Like, that is, like, not only did they take it back, but they like escalated the fight. Like, they escalated right. the injustice. Um, and one of the hardest, I don't, I, want, I gotta be honest with you, we oftentimes look to the South and to people with the MAGA hats on and, and blame them for all of our problems. But some of the biggest issues is with white liberal, white liberal people, liberal folks. I hate to say that some of my best friends and some of the people I, I love and respect the most, but they come in with their paternalism, um, with their sense of in, entitlement, uh, with the in, intellectualism and all the other tools that they have to keep things in place. And we still end up in the same situation at the end of the day. Um, well, that's kind of like the pitfall of it. Like we were discussing before, the idea of like, you know, oh, we have some people of color on our board or you know, we did, we put out this statement on anti-racism or we have a diversity, equity, inclusion committee, and that's all theater. Because when you look behind the curtains, right, you made a statement on anti-racism and yet there's no equity between races in and your you, institution. And nothing has changed. You look at a diversity, <laughs> equity, and inclusion committee and you have people that are literally hostile against diversity, equity, and inclusion in there. So the idea, so that's, I guess my last question is what does progress look like for civil rights and racial equity? Is it two steps forward, four steps back, and then three steps forward, one step back? Yeah. Only imagine a community or, or, or in America where people um, are lifted up by their own power where communities are self-sufficient and where all of our children grow up um, with an equal chance at the opportunities that that they work for and that they, they deserve. And I say that, I can only imagine, because even though we've been throwing this word equity around for, for like 40 years now, um, all over mission statements and identity documents, all over school policy, but we have not seen equity anywhere in this country anywhere in this country. And I say that with a lot of vigor. Um, and I, when, I'm at, when I'm in the college, I, I teach around this as well. To my students, it's a question, where have you seen equity? And we haven't really seen it. And the reason I say that is because hmm. in the year 2021, we can still, still safely predict, even in places like Valley Spring, life outcomes based on race that black and brown children in Valley Scream have a higher probability of being arrested, of being incarcerated, of being in contact with the child welfare system. Being suspended from school being six times. School, being expelled from school. <laughs> being, yeah, being, being expelled from school. Um, lifetime income is lower. Um, mortality rates for even our children, for babies born, lower birth weight and higher infant mortality here and here in beautiful Long Island. Um, we can still safely predict those things with, like Christina, with frightening accuracy. And if you add zip code to the mix here in Nassau, like places like Roosevelt and Hempstead and parts of Westbury, it gets even more frightening. Therefore, we don't mm -hmm. have equity. We, we will only have equity when you can no longer safely predict those type of life, life outcomes uh, for our people. And we have not seen one place in America where that can't be done still. So... That reminds me of something I was reading uh, regarding and the way you were talking about making people uncomfortable with the status quo because, and when I say people, I mean people in dominant groups, right? Because it's really fucking uncomfortable for everyone else. So it's about making things uncomfortable, but in terms of talking about institutions, actually it's funny because I just saw the documentary of Martin Luther King and his daughter said that he talked about the, bu the bus boycott, right? Mm -hmm. And he's like, we didn't want to put the bus company out of business. We just didn't want to make race profitable. We want to make justice profitable. Mm -hmm. So 
how do we make justice profitable in our institutions? I mean, it's work. You're saying nothing is equitable. So it's work because you have to upend the system. It's work. But even in, when we have seen small glimpses of, of justice and real diversity in institutions, they actually do better. Companies do better. You know, like Fortune 500 companies do better with diverse leadership at the top. You know, that? that's a, like a yeah. five statistic. They actually do better. Companies do better when they reach a broader range of people from different races, like in backgrounds, like... We just haven't gotten that as much in our in our education, higher education, uh, right. and on the ground, and on, on the ground is in, in many other places. But this could be such more, such such a beautiful, such a much more beautiful experience, lived experience here in in Long Island, but across America, if we just embrace difference, right? Like it pays <laughs> to embrace <laughs> difference. <laughs> um, and we haven't we have we haven't gotten that yet. And the same way that racism has been institutionalized, we have to institutionalize anti-racism as well. And that's not an easy job. And that's going to take some time, and it's going to take a lot of people. But we have to keep pushing in that direction. We we can't get one of the things that I hold on to around race and racism, even though it's very painful to watch and even think about thinking back on my own experiences and the experiences of my children, family members. The pain of it, even though it's painful and even though it's hurtful, I still come into these conversations with hope. Because hmm. I, I believe that race and racism was constructed. Yeah. And anything that was constructed can be deconstructed. We just have to find out how it was constructed, how it's being maintained, and how can we collectively, across race, begin a process of dismantling it. And that's where my hope lies. And I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful by podcasts like this and all the work that you're doing and the work that I'm doing and the people that we don't even know about that. Yeah. Doing. Like Emily Kaufman from out in Suffolk County doing um, uh, the policing, uh, po police reform, mm -hmm. Long Island United and, and all those folks. So there are people like that are doing work and we just have to connect with each other and, and become more powerful. And also there is a lot of work to be done. It, you don't have to do everything. So don't feel overwhelmed. You should do some, you should evaluate what you're passionate about and see what your skill set is and use your sharpest tool in your box right. to affect change. Right. There's a lot of places where help is needed. <laughs> a lot. So before we end this, I wanted to give you the last word. How do you usually end your seminars or your workshops or your presentations? I need to end it with a thing called whoop, there it is, but I want to do <laughs> But I want to say that there is that there is hope, um, as I just mentioned, and that it's really we have to come together in our own healing circles, particularly our internalized racial oppression as people of color, because Superman is not coming. That we have this is some there's some things we got to rescue ourselves from. Um, and this work that, I, that we just talked about this around colorism and distancing and assimilation and model minority and all that stuff. Um, it's not in the DSM-4 or DSM-5. People are not being taught in schools to address this within our community. So it's really up to us to, to begin the process of, of addressing it ourselves. Because if we don't heal, it's going to be very, very difficult to change the systems and institutions that we come in contact with. They're going to crush us because we're going to be weakened by our own self. And Ugh. I'll end with that. Let's just all do the work. <laughs> just work? Do the work. <laughs> all right. Maurice, thank you so much for being a guest at the Thank podcast and stay, well, I was gonna say stay warm, but it's getting spring-like soon. <laughs> um, and stay healthy, get the vaccine. I would do that. I took my, I've got both <laughs> shots, I'm good. Really? <laughs> yeah, I did, I got both shots. Mine is coming up April 7th. Oh, well, good for you. Good for yes, you. I'm very excited. Thank you so much and have a good night. Thank uh, you. you too. All right, blessings. All right.